morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Just when you thought that song was just in, a, in, a, in the pocket, it went higher. It went higher, you guys. That, thank you. Thank you, you guys, for, uh, for sharing your talents with us. We're blessed as a church. You guys realize this? We are blessed as a church to have the, uh, the caliber of, of musicians, and not just good musicians, men and women that love Jesus and want to use their talent to really embody Psalm 150. If you've never read Psalm 150, it said, Praise the Lord with guitars and keyboards and drums and voices. And, you know, I'm like, all right, full throttle, here we go. So uh, thank you, you guys, for, uh, for, for blessing us th- in this way. And so tonight, worship night, this morning, worship morning, right? It doesn't change, does it? We're just, we're going to center our minds and our hearts on, on Jesus and use the word and use music to do that. Uh, is his grace enough? Is his grace enough? He is, he has been more than loving and more than kind to us and, uh, it's amazing to, to be loved by the God, uh, the God of over everything, and uh, he loves us in Jesus, and it's awesome to be with you guys. So uh, before we really hightail it into, into 1 John chapter 3, turn your Bibles there if you would. We'll get a little head start. Um, I don't know about you, but man, it seems like my week has just been like, you know, every day just hit the ground running 60 miles per hour. And uh, has anyone had a week like that where you just feel like, I haven't had a chance to slow down, and I just want to invite us just for a couple minutes in just to a time of, of silence. I don't know how many of you have ever considered worship can also be silent. That there are times when we just need to quiet our hearts, focus our minds, perhaps take inventory of where we've been, and just, just don't come running roughshod into this time of, of worship together. So can I just invite us into a time of just silence before the Lord and make this time a time of silencing your cell phones, silencing your tablet, perhaps harder, silencing the the busyness of the week. Maybe make this time a, a time where you're really praying the Psalms, chapter 46, be still and know that I am God. Whew. Keep your eyes, bow your heads w- with me if you would. And make that your silent prayer before the Lord this morning. And Lord, help me to be still. Lord, help me remove the distractions. Lord, help me to silence competing voices. For the only voice we hear this morning is you. Lord, help me take account of the things that I've done or I've participated in that has perhaps impacted my relationship with you negatively. Perhaps it's a thought. Perhaps it's a word said. Perhaps it's just a a sinful disposition of my heart. Lord, we come before you. I pray in a confessional posture.
inviting you, your spirit, to cleanse our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. We praise you for being a God who hears our confession and is eager to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you prove yourself faithful to us time and time again. Create in us a clean heart, O Lord. See if there be any anxious way in us, any sinful presence in us. Create in us that clean heart, Father. May the thoughts of our mind and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. We are here to seek your face. We are here to gaze upon the beauty of Jesus. Remove anything that would hinder us from from accomplishing that. Be glorified in this time, Father. Thank you for this community, for this family. We unite our hearts and our minds in Christ. We thank you for this time together. And all God's people said, Amen. First John chapter 3 is where we're going to be. Turn there if you would. So, Sergio Dip had a tough time this week. Um... If you don't know who Sergio Dip is, he is an ESPN reporter for the uh, the Spanish affiliate Deportes. But he made his Monday night football appearance this past Monday night, along with uh, one of the first female NFL uh, reporters, along with Rex Ryan, ex coach of the of the Jets, etc. So they went to a quick on-field moment with Sergio Dip. Here's his moment in front of millions of people, and many would consider it an ultimate flop. The Twitterverse slid up so fast. Who is this guy? Because here he is trying to translate his, his original language into English so that the, the American audience would understand him. And I think everyone was just like, what just happened? What was just said, so much was lost in translation. But what's amazing is while there was this this outpouring of just frustration and confusion, there was equally this outpouring of like, we want that guy back because whatever he said, it was awesome. Whatever he did was great. It, It turned a boring game into something exciting. It took a boring commentary by the other announcers as as something wonderful, but but most people were bewildered. Most people were just very vocal about their their frustration with this this guy Sergio Dip. And I just sat there and went, "Isn't it true that sometimes when you put yourself out there, you're you're just going to become uh, you're just going to get lambasted sometimes? You ever even put yourself out there, meaning good, your intentions are there, and you just have your critics. You just have people that are just going to." And I believe that happens to us as followers of Christ. Something gets lost in translation when it, when it happens, doesn't it? When, it, when it, we're trying to be these spiritual people and we're trying to earnestly love God and we put ourselves out there and, and it just doesn't come out the way it should and people are so quick to jump on you and, and label you. Well, if you call yourself a Christian, why, why would you say that? Or you call yourself a Christian, why would you do that? And something just gets lost in translation. You ever considered how how impactful, how perhaps hurtful this is for us as followers of Christ. See, this morning we get to take inventory together as a family, and there's nothing wrong with putting yourselves out there. I want us to be men and women who put ourselves out there because the stage is 
is set and and we're out there for people to see and you're going to have your critics. But I pray that this would be a place where you find support. I pray that this would be a place that says, you know what, big deal what they say, big deal what they think. Get out there and be courageous and be hopeful that God's doing something. So you might have your Sergio dip moment. And let me just tell you, they're just moments, right? Because God doesn't want perfection from us, but he wants us to to keep going. He wants us to persevere. So write that word down, persevere. See, God doesn't want perfection. You're not going to be perfect, but he expects you to persevere. And, And later that night, Sergio Dip went to Twitter and posted an apology from his hotel room. And and you could just hear like how well he just he wanted to do so well and issued this apology. And, you know, my my hope is that he comes back. I like the guy. He's full of heart. He's full of passion. So what if things got lost in translation? So what if he didn't have his shining moment the very first time he was on this huge national stage? And I want that kind of hope for my life. I want people who believe in me to say, you know what? You may not be perfect, but I love your tenacity. I love your perseverance. So this morning we turn to 1 John and he's got some wonderful words to say to us, some some challenging words to say to us. And I was just thinking about my role as a pastor and my my role as a teacher of the word of God. And I uh, I summarized my my responsibility to someone this week. And I said, part of my responsibility in teaching the word and especially difficult passages like the one we're going to come to today is to not just comfort the afflicted, but sometimes my responsibility is to afflict the comforted. So this morning, uh, I may do that. I may do that because we come to a passage that perhaps is one of the most difficult in all of Scripture. Matter of fact, pastors, men and women throughout the ages, have been divided over the meaning of these verses that we're going to tackle this morning. So my prayer is that nothing would be lost in translation, that I'm going to put myself out there, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you what I believe the Word is, is teaching us, and I pray for those that are afflicted, you may be comforted, and I pray that those who are comforted may be afflicted. So we turn to 1 John chapter 3, turn your Bibles there if you would, and we're going to start at verse 4, and we're going to notice uh, three important things this morning in your notes, but let's read the passage first. Verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Go ahead and underline that phrase. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, at first glance, we may conclude some different thoughts from this passage. The obvious one is, it seems like John's saying, if you know Jesus, you better be perfect. Because if you know Jesus, you don't sin. Well, how many of us ruined that whole premise this morning? Amen. This is called Sinners Anonymous. Hi, my name's Scott, and I sin today. The question is, how many times, Pastor Scott, did you sin today, Right? So the the first glance is, okay, what's John saying? Because I've sinned, should I question my relationship with God? Should I question my salvation? Maybe I really don't know Jesus. And all of a sudden, this spiritual schizophrenia falls into place. 
That's not what John's saying. He's not saying if you're a Christian, you'll never sin. Everyone take a deep breath. That's good news. Secondly, what we need to understand here is when you read it, he's talking about there's a group among these early Christians that says there's a deception, meaning you can love Jesus, but at the same time live your life any way you want. The idea is, you know, whatever is of the spirit is worth focusing on, but whatever it has to do with the physical body, do whatever you want with it. You're still saved at the end of the day. I.e., you can take great license with the way you live your life. You say you love Jesus and you're headed to heaven, but you're living your life like hell. That's okay. But John says, let no one deceive you. So all of a sudden now we have these two ends of the spectrum. We have this this idea that how does the Christian life, how is it lived out if if we're not perfect? What do we do with our imperfections? But at the other end of the spectrum is this idea that just because you have Jesus, does that mean we can just live life however we want and we think we're okay? Well, we need to fall somewhere in the middle of understanding these two ends of the spectrum. And I believe John gives us incredible insight In this passage, see, last week we talked about the the second coming of Jesus, that we need to prepare ourselves for Christ's arrival, for his appearing, that we ought to walk in holiness and righteousness because we don't know the day or the hour, even though there was just another report yesterday that someone said Jesus is coming back September 23rd. Don't buy it. Just last week I taught on this, right? I'm thinking to myself, hope this camp dies. And once again, someone's come out. All biblical signs point to September 23rd. I'm like, oh, help us, Lord. Help us. We don't know the day or the hour, but we should always be prepared. There's a readiness. But as we think about the second coming of Christ, John now shares with us important truths about the first coming of Jesus. When he came 2,000 years ago and what he accomplished for us not only to be saved, but what did he accomplish for the lives that we ought to live? So that's the premise we're going to operate from this morning. And we're going to notice the first point, verse 4, the nature of sin. This is a word that is not talked about a lot in our culture. See, we don't want to have anything to do with sin. We don't want to have to talk about sin. And I'm going to tell you right now that the Bible is very, very clear when it comes to this topic of sin. Sin is is the very thing that separates us from God. No one can know God, no one can see God, no one can have a relationship with God unless this sin piece is taken care of. Sin entered the human race through one man named Adam. This is according to Romans chapter 5. Through one man, Adam, sin came in and tainted all of our lives. Because of disobedience, because of rebellion, back to Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve basically stood up before God and said, hey, we love your plan, but we like our plan better, and were rebellious and did what God had commanded them not to do. So what is sin? What does John say in verse 4? Sin is lawlessness. Every single human being born into the world is an outlaw to God. See, lawlessness is not the result of sin. Lawlessness is the essence of sin. It is a rejection of God's rightful rule as Lord over our lives. It is active rebellion against God's known will. It is a defiant violation of God's moral law. It's basically the middle finger to God saying, we don't love you, we love ourselves more than you, and we'll do whatever we want. So the lordship of God is thrown out the window. And believe it or not, there are people who will tell you that you can embrace Jesus as Savior, but it's optional to embrace him as Lord. The Bible does not give you that choice. I would love to take a college course and be like, I'll take the classes, but don't you dare give me the exams. I would love to go get a driver's license and say, hey, I'll get the license, but you don't dare post the speed limit. See, 
You don't make Jesus Lord. Can I just share the good news with you? Jesus is Lord. This is his world. We are created in his image. There is an accountability that goes beyond ourselves. And unless we understand the true nature and wickedness of sin, we won't understand the lordship of Christ over every area of our lives. As Christians, we don't compartmentalize our lives and say, Jesus, you can have my 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 technology life over here and you can have my dietary life over here and you can have my my workout life over here but my marriage nope that's that's mine my 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 hobbies nope that's mine the things i watch on tv nope that's mine all a l l write that word down all caps circle it all of your life falls under the reign of the lordship of jesus your mind your heart your sex your your power your greed your everything falls under the lordship of christ and you've heard me say this before and i'm going to stand by it if christ is not lord over all he is not lord over anything How you live your lives, what you do with your lives, how you conduct your lives, your behavior, your attitudes, everything, it has to somehow reflect God's loving, sovereign rule over those areas. The good news is we're progressively learning what that looks like. Because some things are hard to submit to God. You know, when I when I counsel a young couple and, and they're not married and... And I encourage them, don't shack up together before you get married. This is not a leasing with an option to buy scenario. Keep your pants on. I know sex is good, it's created by God, but do not sleep with another person until that band is on the hand and you've made a lifelong commitment. There's a reason why you limit yourself to one or two beers, because once you get the three beers, you are incorrigible. There are things that we have to establish and say, no, I, I can do it, but it's the wise thing to do. We fight for our marriages. We fight for our kids. We conduct ourselves at work in a manner that reflects the lordship of Jesus. It doesn't matter what area we're talking about. Christ must be shown to be sovereign over that area. Because if not, you're going to fall to a lie. This is the lie that infected the garden, Genesis 3. That, you know what, maybe we can question God's will. Maybe we can malign his character. Maybe we can discredit what he wants and and question his wisdom. Can I just tell you, I'd be up here all day confessing the ways I thought my way was better than God's way. And in those situations, I say no way. So this morning, I'm going to say Yahweh. All right, so that's the better way. Sin is lawlessness. It is no good. And we shift to verse 5, and look what it says. Jesus appeared to take away our, what does it say? Sins. If you have a Bible that has no sin word there, get rid of that Bible. It's like the Thomas Jefferson Bible, right? He came to take away these things, which now brings us to the second point, the nature of Christ's work. See, John wants us to understand. Look at verse 5. Jesus appeared to take away our sins. Therefore, if you believe in Jesus, if you claim him as Lord and Savior, if you claim him to be the one who died on the cross for your sins, then what business is there between you who say you abide in Jesus and you who still cling to your sins? Now, notice the word, Practice. How many times does the word practice appear in this passage? Numerous times. Here's the good news. The good news is God's not wondering if you're going to sin. He knows it will happen. The question and the concern is, are you making a practice 
of sin? Is it is it habitual in your life? Because if it is a continual practice or a habit, that's where John says you need to stop and examine yourself to see if you're really in Christ. Because Christ and sin cannot coexist in the same place. Matter of fact, we need to talk about four points. And I believe this is going to help us flesh out some very important truths of Scripture really having to do with your identity. You say you love Jesus, you say you're a Christian, but what are the things that we can really hold on to that bring hope and confidence in the midst of this ongoing struggle that we have with sin? Three thi- four things we're going to look at. Number one, a new life. Secondly, a new nature. Third, a new power. And fourth, new desire. This is the litmus test for us to see where we're at with Christ. Because like I said, I'm not only here to comfort the afflicted, but I'm here to afflict the comforted. Not everyone who sits in our churches believes in Jesus. Just because you sing the songs, just because you take communion, just because you have a Bible, doesn't mean you're in. I want to make sure you're in. I don't want you to have a false assurance. I don't want you to believe the lies of the world. How we live our lives is of utmost importance when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, first point is this. We receive a new life. So, verse 5 says, Christ came to take away our sins. Isn't this awesome that Jesus comes? He does for us what we could never do for ourselves because sin is really, it's lawlessness. It's this indebtedness to God, and he demands perfection. Well, none of us could live up to that. Luckily, we have one whose name is Jesus. He's our substitute. He steps in and pays the price we could never pay. Because in, in, in credit score terminology, your credit score, score is so poor with God, you don't measure up. And that reminds me of an app I heard about this week. There's a new dating app out where they will actually factor in your credit score. Because who wants to get hooked up with somebody who has got a bad credit score? And part of me goes, that's awesome! Right? But part of me goes, spiritually speaking, none of us, if God all of a sudden opened up his dating app going, gee, who could I have a relationship with? And all of a sudden your credit score is like sub-zero. Thank God for Jesus. Right? Because with Jesus, your credit score is out of, the, out of this world. It is off the chart. No one has had a better credit score than Jesus. And now when you trust him, he gives you his credit score. And now God says, I love you. And I want to have a relationship with you. Is that awesome? So this is the new life that God gives us because of Jesus' work. What we could never do, God does. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we may become children of God. Amen? High fives all the way around. Your grace is enough, right? Grace is being given that which you do not deserve. And so what we do, we do, we celebrate new life. And since there is no sin in Jesus, it is obvious that if we live in him, we will not sin either. We don't make a practice of sin. And I'm going to tell you, if you say you love Jesus and just continue to, to do the things that God does not want you to do, Paul says in Philippians 3, you are really an enemy of the Christ, of cross. You're an enemy of Christ. Which brings us to our second point. The new, what did I say? Nature. This is huge right now. Can I tell you how important it is to understand this point? And I'm going to tell you right now, this is the most important part of the message. So those of you who have been sleeping, wake up. And when I'm done with this point, you can go back to sleep. As a Christian, as a believer in Christ. Contrary to some what pastors, some pastors teach, contrary to somehow some Bible translations translate certain things in the Bible, I'm going to tell you something right now, and this is going to be a moment. In Christ, you have one new nature. Okay? There is some theology out there that would tell you that as Christians, we have two natures within, within us. There's an old nature and there's a new nature, and they're constantly competing with each other. Can I tell you right now, that is not biblically correct. In Christ, you have one 
new nature. The old is gone. The new has come. When I first was saved by Christ at age 15, some wise person told me the importance of memorizing Bible verses. And they gave me the six Bible verses that were the most important verses to learn as a new believer in Christ. Do you know what the first two verses were that I memorized as a, as a teenager? 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 2.20. Two verses that speak to my identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm ready to do the Holy Spirit hop right now. (laughs) Come on now! If anyone is in Christ, if you have union with Jesus... He is a new creation. The old is what? Gone. It's not cohabitating. It's not the the odd couple. It's not the Felix Unger that you wish wasn't living there but is. 2 Corinthians 5. If any man is a new creation in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. How important is that for us to understand? That I don't have these two natures warring within me that leads to a sp- spiritual schizophrenia. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live. Meaning I have died. Crucifixion was a fatal way of killing people. Crucifixion didn't leave people hanging there that were mostly dead. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is now Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The two first verses I memorized as a young follower of Jesus have sat with me now for 32 years. And can I tell you, How freeing and how liberating it is to go back to that place and go, yes, that is truth. Yes, I have a new identity. I don't have two natures warring within me. I don't have two dogs fighting within me that are very hungry. I have one new nature in Christ within me. The old is gone, the new has come. I am a new man in Jesus. And that is going to help any one of us navigate in this world because it is a struggle but the struggle is made easier knowing that you are now a new person in jesus i'm not the same person i was 32 years ago i'm not the same person i was 25 years ago i'm not the same person i was 15 years ago i'm not the same person i was a year ago i am a new person in christ and becoming ever newer in christ why because i don't give consideration to my old nature That guy is gone. He is dead. He has been crucified with Christ. And now I live my life by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. Do do you understand how, how awesome this is? I wish every single follower of Jesus would hear this. This is why translations are important because NIV translations botch this. Every time they talk about the struggle, they talk about your sin nature. The sin nature is gone. Colossians chapter 2, one of my favorite sections of scripture. Write it down. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 15 in that area. It says that Jesus has circumcised our old flesh and tossed it away. Can I talk about, let me just talk about circumcision. It's gross. It's disgusting, right? Uh, We don't need visuals, right? Amen. So circumcision of the flesh is where they take a little boy, right? And they, they take the foreskin off. And no one I've ever known holds on to the foreskin that's been taken off. Wouldn't that be weird? You're like at someone's house and like, what's that on the fireplace? Oh, it's my foreskin <laughs> sitting there in formaldehyde. <laughs> Sick. Disgusting. That old part has been tossed. No one holds on to it. 
Well, because Paul says in Colossians, God, you have had the circumcision of the heart. The old person has been tossed away. The new is here. That's the reality of it. You are now a new creature, created in God's image for good works, and now you ought to reflect that. I've got it. Thank you. First time ever, prepared. New creature in Christ, right here. Got my, old, my, my own Kleenex. I know, seriously, listen. You are a new creature in Christ if you have Jesus. So important to understand. But your question is, but how, how come I still feel the effects of the old nature? How come I still struggle with sin? Can I tell you, there's this thing, and I, and I came up with this years ago, and you've probably heard me say this, but I'm going to say it once again. There's this thing called the phantom limb theory. Soldiers, men and women who lose an arm, lose a leg, they live with this appendage for most of their lives, but for some reason they have to have it amputated or they lose it in war or conflict. Do you know how long it takes for that person to come to the realization that they no longer have what they once had? Men and women who think they have an arm because they live with that arm for 30 years while they've had it amputated for years beyond the amputation they still feel as if they have an arm they're going to do things as if they have an arm and in reality they don't think about this in spiritual terms there's this idea that you've been living with some sins for most of your lives and you have to learn through practice and through obedience and through pursuing righteousness that you no longer have to do that thing that thing is no longer present in your life, even though the enemy wants to use it and influence you negatively. God reminds you, you're free from that. You no longer have to deal with sin because he has taken care of the penalty and the power of it. So what you have held on to for most of your lives, that very thing that hinders your relationship with God, it is gone. It is done away with. You're a new creature in Christ bank on that promise which leads us to the third point you have a new power you have the power to overcome these things see as christians we may fall into sin but i will tell you as christians we will never walk in it do we mess up yes do we make mistakes Yes. Is there the tripping up that happens spiritually in our lives? Yes. But you will not make a practice of it in your life. Why? Because if you have Christ, Christ and sin are at odds with each other. They do not coexist in the same place at the same time. This is what John is saying. Anyone who knows Jesus knows that sin does not dwell in that place. But you're given a new power. The Bible says that Jesus came, look at verse 8, to destroy the works of the devil. See, when we think about Christmas and we think about the coming of, of, of the Son of God into the world, we, you know, we sing joy to the world and heart the hair of the angels and all these wonderful songs. When was the last time you heard a Christmas message on the destru destroying nature of God's love? He came into the world to destroy. That's awesome. But it's a very severe word for a very severe predicament. He came to destroy the works of the devil, which means this, that Jesus' death on the cross, his burial in the grave, and his resurrection has basically robbed Satan, robbed sin, robbed death of its power. It is now rendered inoperative, and you... In Christ have been given more than you ever realized to conquer and overcome the sin that's trying to entangle you. Is that awesome or what? You have been given new power in Christ. Don't tell me you can't. The real issue is you won't. You are now given access to the throne of grace where Hebrews says you boldly approach and you approach it with humility, you approach it with grace, and you there find confidence because you approach with boldness the one who was once your enemy but now is your heavenly father because of Jesus. You are now 
able to ask God, help me through these difficulties. Help me through these struggles. And God says, I would not want to withhold anything from the child I love for you to be successful in your spiritual walk. People who come with a defeated attitude don't understand the gospel. It's one thing to struggle. It's another thing to let that struggle debilitate you. You have been given power from on high. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now operating within you if you avail yourself to it. Woo! I get a, my wife and I get to spend Tuesday night. We're not doing small group at our house because we're doing small group with Bono and you two at University of Phoenix on Tuesday night. So... Uh, we'll be in section 422, the nosebleeds, but we'll be there going, yeah, you too. Can I tell you, 20 plus years ago, I got a chance to high five the band, you too. Bono, The Edge, Adam Clayton, um, Larry Mullen Jr. Because I worked backstage at one of the tours at the Sun Devil Stadium Pop Mart with Rage Against the Machine. So I was there, and you know, not everyone got to be backstage to see those guys. You want to know why? Because I was given an all-access pass. And can I tell you, I was... I was the man. I was the man with my all-access badge at the Pop Mart tour. I'm like, I got to go backstage, and I had to. I was helping set up, and I was helping do things just purely because I knew a guy that was part of the roadie crew. And I got backstage, and when the band was heading out, they were high-fiving all of us. I got to high-five all those guys. And can I tell you, a YouTube junkie like me, that was like a dream come true. But I was only able to be there because of the past that was given me to me to have access to that place. Can I tell you, folks, in Christ you've been given access to the throne of God. You've been given this pass, and his name is Jesus, and he says, come on in. There's the Father, come to the throne, ask, be bold, have confidence. With humility and grace, know your Father loves you and he wants what's best for you. And so it is up to us to take advantage of the power he gives us to live our lives. The problem is we don't. We don't access the power. We try to do this on our own steam. And how many of you have been burnt out numerous times because you're trying to live this spiritual life according to your own power? It's not about you. It's about him. Where is the first place we derive power from? Number one, his word. And can I tell you, because we neglect the word, we neglect the power therein. James chapter 1 says, we approach the word and it's like a mirror. And the word shows us truth about God. The word shows us truth about ourselves. The word shows us where we need to have correction made in the course of our our daily lives. And James chapter 1 says, if you look in the mirror of God's word and you walk away and you don't make the changes that the word has shown you, you're, a, you're merely a hearer and you're not a doer. And the law of liberty does, probably does not exist within you. But if you look in the mirror of God's word and you go, wow, I need to change this or I need to do that or I need to avoid this or I need to whatever, and you walk away and you change according to what God has brought to your attention, you're not just a hearer, you're a doer. And now the perfect law of liberty is able to do what it needs to do in your lives. Can we just be honest? How many of us have gone to the word of God and seen the mirror and we're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And you walk away and you suffer the consequences for it. Because why? There's a momentary rebellion that exists within our hearts. And here's the key. If you know Christ that rebellion should lead to conviction. But if you, know, if you don't know Jesus, you rebel and you rebel and rebel and you don't care anything about it. You can go through a charade. You can go through lip service. But the s- true test is what the word does. And if it brings about conviction and you act on it, that is evidence of the spirit of God living within you. Which leads now to the fourth point. New desires. The beauty of God's love for us is that he knows we're petulant children. The beauty of God's love for us is that he knows we're stubborn people. 
and God is committed to us. He's faithful when we're faithless. Amen? He is, he's committed to love us even when we don't love Him. But when we have the Spirit of God, when we've trusted in Jesus, and it says even in John verse 9, the seed of God ab- uh, abides in us, there's something that happens to your desires. You do not want to dishonor God. There is a desire that says, I am now going to hate what tried to hold me in bondage before Christ. I'm going to hate anything that stands in the way of my fellowship with God. And I'm going to love righteousness, and I'm going to love holiness, and I'm going to love purity, as tough as it may be. As tough as certain decisions are when it comes to following God, when the world would choose the opposite, you're going to choose what God wants. Why? Because the desires have changed. When sin happens, here's the question. Matter of fact, write down some C words. Okay, you know me, I like alliteration. Number one C word, conviction. If you are in Christ, when sin happens, conviction ensues. But if we're stuck at conviction... That's a despairing place to remain. Conviction ought to lead to confession. Confession is revealing your heart before the Lord. And knowing that God knows everything already, you come clean in light of of His holiness. You come clean and you just lay out all the dirt. Can I just tell you, that's a tough thing to do. But there's nothing more freeing than the act of doing it because you don't want to hold on to that anymore. Conviction leads to confession, which then leads to cleansing. See, what God promises in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, is that if we confess our sins, we will find God there ready to cleanse us and forgive us and restore us. So the idea is that if I'm in Christ and the seed of God, His Spirit, His Word abides in me, the moment I sin, there should be something that happens that says, No! My nature, my identity says this is not good. I'm broken over it, hence conviction, and I come and I pour my heart out before God. Like my children, you know, when one of my kids does something that they know that I don't want them to do, boy, you can tell. The countenance, the spirit, you know, they're not running to meet you at the door when you come home. They're hiding, but but through tears and brokenness, there's nothing more beautiful than a child who understands that what they've done is wrong, that they have done something that you as their parent didn't want them to do, They seek genuine forgiveness and there's nothing but tears coming from your eyes and you embracing that child saying, I'm so glad you shared. Let's learn from the mistake. All right, let's get back on the road. That's awesome. That's what God does with us. He says, let conviction lead to confession, which then confession leads to cleansing. And then ultimately we know that cleansing will be this claim of, oh yes, it's good to be his kid good to have god as our heavenly father and that he's a god who continually forgives us because we need it don't we we need continual forgiveness because we're going to make mistakes and we're going to botch things up you guys know victory has already been been won by jesus you guys know this you know i was reminded i was reading of the japanese soldiers after world war ii had ended that troops were still finding, hiding in the jungles, thinking that there was still war, and they were invited to come out of the caves they were hiding in because they didn't realize the war was over, and they were ready for combat. And they're going, guys, there's no more battle. There's no more war. You can come out and live freely. And the look on these guys' face was like, what, really? See, how do we, we need to be reminded of this, right? The battle is the Lord's. He is more than victorious. He is our conqueror. Claim your position in Christ that if he is in you, he's greater than he who is in the world. You have nothing to be worried about. 
Just love your father, abide in him, and let him call the shots. This is the work of Christ, and he will prove his faithfulness to you day in and day out. Which leads us to our last point. The nature of Christian experience. Verse 9 and 10, no one who is born of God practices sin. No one makes a habitual lifestyle out of sinning. Why? Because God's seed abides in him. Whether this is God's truth, whether this is God's spirit, it could be all of this. You have now a new seed implanted within you and you cannot sin. Why? Because you have been born of God. God and by this the children of God and the children of the devil are, are obvious. Notice how black and white John is right here. Either you're in the child of God camp or you're in the child of Satan camp. I mean, this is severe. But let me just tell you sin is severe. Deceit is severe. Lawlessness is severe. What does it say? That anyone who does not practice righteousness, if you are not on a course in pursuing righteousness, you are obviously not in the family of God. Here's the line of delineation right here. When we practice righteousness, when we make God, God's passions our passions, when we pursue holiness, and righteousness with reckless abandon, when we consult the Word of God, when we pray, when we serve God in various ways, when we are quick to confess sins before God, when we realize the new nature and those new desires and those new passions have changed because of God, this is a good thing. This is the practicing of righteousness. It requires discipline. But if there's no cause for concern, if you are indifferent to sin, you ought to to stop and consider yourself in the wrong family. Write down two words if you would. Sometimes things just come to my brain and I just want to share them with you guys. If you're in Christ, you're sh you should be remaining in Christ. Write the word remaining. Abiding. Remaining. He is the vine and we are the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But in him, we can do everything. He is our source of life. He is our source of food. He is our source of energy. I want, we're all spiritually hungry. The problem is, is when we try to satisfy that hunger in ways that God doesn't approve of. Satisfy your spiritual hunger with the things that God has said, this is good for you. So you remain in Christ. Abide. Have an intimate relationship with Him. Second word, R. Word. Resemble. Notice how John ends verse 10. If you are remaining with Him as He is His seeds in you, you're going to resemble Jesus. And how does John say this resemblance looks? It looks like loving your brother. Love is righteousness in action. Loving those who you like, loving those who you don't like. Loving those you get along with, loving those you don't get along with. Loving Cowboys fans, loving Packers fans, loving Ron Leofow, loving Rod Horn, loving Becky Ferguson. I mean, Love is manifested in a lot of ways, but you love not just the people that are easy to love. You love the people that are difficult to love. You, you love your enemies. You pray for those who persecute you. Perhaps the measure of the seed that abides in you from God is the measure which you love all people. No matter what they've done, no matter what they may look like, no matter what their track record is, you love. Why? Because God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you resemble Jesus? Because if God's seed abides in you, you will look like Jesus. You will act like Jesus. You will speak like Jesus. However imperfectly, you may have your Sergio dip moments, but guess what? We are all works in progress. Are you remaining and are you resembling? 
That is a good litmus test for all of us. Let me close with this. Someone who I've, I've probably never quoted here, probably because he lived 400 years ago, a guy named Erasmus, he says this, By a carpenter mankind was made, and only by that carpenter can mankind be remade. In Christ, he has remade us. We are redeemed by his blood. We are regenerated by his spirit. We are reconciled with the Father. And now we are ready to serve him. That's my prayer for you guys. I hope that's your prayer for me too. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for oh, uh, another time to be together to, to focus on, on that which is truly important. Lord, you know how my heart has been heavy and you know how my heart has wrestled with, with this. And I pray, Lord, that as fallible as I may be, Lord, may your infallible truth be planted in all of our hearts and lives today. Lead us in the proper path, Lord. Help us to be aware, walk in wisdom and discernment, leaning on your power, to live for your glory. And Father, I hope exalting Jesus every step of the way. In word and in deed, Lord, help us to be the men and women you have designed us to be. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Hopefully we'll see you tonight, 7 o'clock.